<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've got McGrath's number one agent for Australia, Alexander Jordan. So thank you for coming on. Thanks, man. Alexander's a new one. No one's called oh, me that, but I'll take really? it. It's very sophisticated. I feel more intelligent now. It's okay. No well, you problem. sound very intelligent and Thanks. sophisticated. Oh, where, did, where did that come from? Oh, I don't think I am, to be honest with you, man. You very um, much are. Really? We've spoke to a lot of real estate agents. Let wow. me tell you. Okay. You are. Okay. That's very kind of you, man. Now, um, I, I want to ask, this is actually coming just a bit off that, that conversation. We, weren't, we won't go into the conversation we were having off, to, off camera, but one thing that that happened during COVID and I did a deep dive into some, some different things. My mind got sidetracked off real estate, right? Went, did the deep dive. I was looking to other different avenues and what have you, but it took my attention away from real estate. How have you been able to navigate your life when you don't, when you're looking at different things and you're looking at what's happening but you're still trying to be focused on real estate. How do you keep your mind focused on the main thing, keeping the main thing the main thing? So I get distracted as well. So I don't think I've got any special ability to remain focused. Having said that though, I think when you look at things in your own perspective, I feel very lucky, very blessed to be in this position. I feel very grateful to have this opportunity. And if I don't f- uh, put my focus into this industry and continue doing what I'm doing, then I'm letting go of something very special. Mm. So those things are always in the back of my mind to make sure that I don't get too distracted and, and veer off on a tangent. Mm. I wouldn't say that I'm ultra focused. I'm, there's a lot of things that I need to improve in my life. But with real estate, I guess it's something that I'm passionate about. I enjoy it. Like you've got to enjoy it. You've got to have some level of interest in, in your role as, mm. a, as an agent. Um, and that's helped, I think. If it was a topic that I had no interest in, then it would be difficult to remain focused. But I like architecture. Like, you know, these things you could say are, are a side hobby that, you know, I keep on learning about and trying to improve myself, but they relate back to the industry. Mm. So I think if you can come up with things that you're passionate about that connect back to real estate, mm. then it's not a job. It becomes yeah. a part of your everyday research. So it yeah. makes it a bit easier. Beautiful. Um, mate. There are uh, there there is a lot of young up and coming agents and associates that are listening that are, that will be listening to this that may not actually necessarily know your story. You've been on some podcasts before, but not for a while. Um, can you give us a bit of it? We'll give the, give our audience a bit of a rundown of your career because I know the first ten years of your career weren't actually the best. Yeah, and then it all changed. I struggled. Yeah, I struggled for probably 10 to 12 years. 10 to 12 years. So, and not with, without sort of intending to succeed. I wanted to be a successful agent. I wanted to do a million dollars GCI. <clears throat> and I thought that I had the skill for it. But for 10 to 12 years, I failed. What was the failure due to? It, it was a personal failure. It was me not putting in enough effort, not being persistent, not doing the hard things. The magic, as they say, is in the work that you avoid. That's, that's the magic. And I was avoiding a lot of that magic. I had to change my perspective, but it took some things in my life to shift me. And I had to hit a mini brick wall for that change to happen. It's fascinating when you look back in life and you look at your challenges and at the time of a challenge, you feel that the world is crumbling and you think, wow, this is really bad. Like my life is not in a good place. But that change, that pivotal moment can make a really positive difference in your life. So today when things happen to me that don't go my way, I have to be rational about it and say, hey, it didn't, doesn't sound positive now, but I might reflect back on this and it could be the best thing that happened in my life. So just to look at things from a different perspective, but my story, to share it with you in, in, in somewhat of a short summary, probably a, a lengthy short summary, I was a musician. I finished school in 1998 and I had a band. That's when I was born. Oh, wow, man. There you go. Holy talk, that makes me feel old. Um, I, feel like we're, I feel like we're on the same page in our maturity here. I didn't feel like I was that far different. Um, so I, I started, um, so I finished school, 1998, um, didn't do well. Um, I was doing music on the side. I got a scholarship to study music at the conservatorium, which is just around here. Finished school, I thought I'm gonna be a musician tried to be a musician, really struggled. Like I couldn't make money. It was, back then we would do a gig at the nightclubs in town in this area 
and we'd get paid $100 per band member. There were six of us. Um, we'd go in at 2 p.m., set up all the speakers, do the sound check. We'd come back, do the gig from 8.30 at night till 2.30 in the morning, pack up our stuff and then go home, get home at 4. Whoa. You had to rehearse and everything, all for 100 bucks per band member. This was back in the late 90s. So I thought, okay, what am I going to do? Like, I can't live like this. Like, it's just not enough um, income. So a friend of mine had a car dealership in a suburb in Brisbane, which is outside the city. It was a second-hand used car dealership, <laughs> low-quality cars. And I went to him and said, uh, would you give me a job? And he said, yeah, I'll give you a job. Um, no salary, but for every car you sell, you get $100. $100 was the going rate for everything back then, obviously. Wow. So I took it. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do daytime here. And then nighttime, I'll do the gigs when we had gigs. And I was selling about seven cars a week on average. These are Stop cheap bad. cars. It was all right. Back getting, then, that's good money. It was reasonable for me. Um, but it wasn't working for the business owner. So he came to me and said, look, unfortunately, uh, this, this is not working for me. Normally, the client, the customer would come in and they would walk into the office and he would serve them and he wouldn't have to pay anyone. I was standing outside in the sun. So when they came, I would serve them mm. and I would get paid. And he thought, well, what's the point? They're going to come to me anyway. And you're not really adding any value. So I said, when do you want me gone? He said, well, as soon as you're ready to go. There was no real employment agreement. It was just one of those sort of casual agreements that we got the job with. So I thought, okay, I've got to find another industry. And I was interested in real estate. I was reading real estate magazines, researching real estate. And funny now that I'm in real estate, I look at car magazines. I research about cars. That's the irony of it. Do you have a favorite car? Me, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I like comfortable cars, man. Like, if I had to choose a car, I'd probably say a Mercedes S-Class, something soft ride. I've got a bad spine. I've got some health issues, so I'm looking for more comfort than speed, even though I bought a sports car myself. Yeah, you should have seen the car I just rocked up in. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm that, that, that does I'm like, that doesn't sound like what no, I just saw. No, that, that, that's actually a softer ride than you'd think. Really? Car. Yeah, definitely it is. It's they got, hammer. They do hammer. Yeah, I don't use it for its speed, but... Um, so what happened then is I, I needed to get a job and there was an ad in the paper, in our local paper here, which is called the Courier Mail. And in the back of the paper, there was a classified ad that said, do you want a job making $250,000 a year, have good work-life balance, which was a stitch up. <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, this is me. Like, yeah, I would love this. So I contacted this gentleman maybe five, six times by email, um, by calls, left messages on his mobile, his landline. He would not get back to me. Then I sent him a cheeky text message. And text messages, this is back in 99, were, were still around, but it was early stages yeah. of text messages. So um, emails were more common back then. Sent him a cheeky text and he liked it. And he said, come and chat to me. I didn't own a car. I didn't own a suit. I lived in housing wow. commission way out from the city. And the wow. suburb I had to go to, I didn't even know where it was. So I had to get out a, back then it was called a Refidex or a UBD. Today it's Google Maps. This was a hard copy <laughs> book. That was the Bible of where, where you could go. Yeah, Looked yeah, it up, yeah. asked my dad to borrow his Mitsubishi Express van, put on a dorky costume with a Mickey Mouse Donald Duck tie, got in the van, off I went, baggy clothes, looked like a total dork, but that's, that's what, I, what I had. Rocked up and he said, look, I like you, you're persistent, but you don't have any experience. So I'll give you a job as an assistant to the office which means that, you know, whatever anyone wants you to do, you go and do it. And my job in the first six months was putting up signboards, dropping off keys, doing rental appointments, um, just whatever I was asked to do, taking photos. Back then, we didn't have professional photography. Yep. We had a camera in-house. You would put the SD card in, go in, take a few snaps, bring it back to the office. They would upload the photos. But to get to work, this is interesting because this has taught me some lessons in life. To get to work, I had to walk to the bus station, which took me about five to 10 minutes, catch a bus from Cavendish Road to Cooparoo train station, get off at Cooparoo train station, catch a train from Cooparoo to Central Station here in the city, then change trains and go from Central Station to Tuong, which was the suburb, and then get off at Tuong station and walk to the office. So it took me almost two hours in the morning, an hour and 40, 45 minutes, an and, hour. and the return trip was the same. So today I get to sit in a nice, comfortable car, air conditioning, and it's a much simpler life. Your but life I have to has think changed. Back to that. So like, you got to think back to that. I think you got to have perspective on life. Um, and there's a lot of people that are struggling, like you, and this is real in today's world. Mm. So there's got to be a lot of gratitude when you get to these positions to say, "Hey, like I'm living the dream that I had in many ways." Yeah. You know, all of us are living a dream that we had, but we forget about it. And as soon as you achieve the dream, there's another dream. 
And there's this never ending chase to satisfy you and you never get to that destination. But the satisfaction is today, like it's now. Because one day we were dreaming of finishing high school. We were dreaming of buying our first car. Driving we were dreaming of getting married, having kids. A lot of people have achieved all those things. So they've lived their dream, but does it feel like it? No, they've replaced it with another dream. And it's this constant search to satisfy themselves with a no ending destination. So I always look back at these moments and go, wow, I've, I'm, I'm very comfortable, I'm very happy, I'm very grateful to be where I am. Um, but that's how real estate started. Six months into this assistant role, I got a sales gig. They gave me a list of open house buyers or attendees. Back then everything was paper documented. There was no sort of CRMs. So I had a big pile of people. All I did is sit down in the office all day, make calls, clean the data. A lot of them hadn't been called for three, four, five years. A lot of them, a lot of them had bought and sold already numerous times and they were wondering why I'm calling them. <clears throat> but I got to, a, I guess, a section of genuine buyers. I wasn't experienced enough to get listings. I was young and didn't look like I, I had that sort of role. If I was giving that job to someone, I wouldn't have chosen myself back then. I was just not experienced enough. But those buyers I serviced and I did lots of deals with them. I introduced them to other agents' listings. Those buyers then became relationships. They turned into sellers and then the business started to improve since then. So just a short summary of how I got into the industry was, was that way. Beautiful. When you are in the industry, can you tell us a story that evolved from there from an associate agent to becoming a selling agent to now being a top $10 million writer? What's that process look like and the learnings in between? You know, I never really had ambitions to become a $10 million agent. I didn't think that was possible. So there was a lack of belief in me for so long, I'd say 10 to 12 years, because I tried. Like I was trying to make it work, mm. but I was capped out at under 500 GCI for the first 12 years of my career. Um, what did it take? It, it, took, it took a brick wall for me to change my attitude and my com commitment to work. You know, I was cruising, I was okay, but I wasn't succeeding in any way. I was watching other agents and I felt that I had the ability to do what they did. But for some reason, through lack of process, lack of persistence, lack of consistency, I wasn't able to, to succeed. 2011 was a breakthrough moment for me. I, we went through the floods in Brisbane and a lot of the areas that I look after were flood impacted. So I had a very average business to start with, but the flood really put me down. Financially, I was broke, had no money. Wow. Um, How old were you at this point? So 2011, I was exactly 30 years old. 30 years old and broke. On the dot of 30, no money, mm. renting uh, a property, <clears throat> couldn't afford the rent for that month, couldn't afford the car repayments. Um, all the properties that I had listed were flooded. They crashed, the deals that I had crashed, the streets were a mess, the pipeline was zero, and the income wasn't coming in. So I was financially broke and I was psychologically unwell. Um, I had a bad health diagnosis that year as well, which you know, I intuitively knew that something wasn't right because I had issues for so many years, sat down with a specialist and he said, you've got a condition that you will not be able to tie your shoelace or drive a car in 10 years time. So I need you to look at a different profession because real estate's not gonna be giving you the longevity, which hit me pretty hard. Like I was like, well, I took it literally. You know, when you get that advice from a specialist or an expert, you think, wow, okay, I've got 10 years. The first time in my life, time became a precious commodity. That was the first time that I realized I've got 10 years now. I've got to provide, I was about to have a child and I had no money and I've got 10 years to make it work. Otherwise, what am I gonna do? I wasn't educated. I lived in housing commission my, all my life. Parents didn't have any money. They were relying on me to succeed and help them out. So it was like, okay, I've got to make it work or give up. Um, but I needed that. I needed that shock to change my attitude. The next morning I woke up at 4 a.m. and I had anxiety and I'll get that a little bit. But that anxiety I channeled into productivity. It was like into energy. And from that moment on, I made a deal with myself that anything I had to do to be successful, all the hard things that I was avoiding, became non-negotiables. Because I used to negotiate with myself all, all the time. You know, I'd have to make calls. I'd go, hmm, don't feel great. I might make them tomorrow. 
and mm. that, that that wasn't an option anymore because there was no capacity to continue. At the same in that same year, I had no money, so I went to my parents who have no money, <clears throat> and they said, "I said I need some money." They gave me five thousand dollars. They took it off the equity of their home. They were borrowing against the equity. They gave me five grand. That took care of my rent, took care of my car repayments until I was able to get some sales and get back on track. But that year was the year that changed my mindset, that changed my work ethic. And for me, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be where I am today. Why? Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's the first word too. That's a wild story. How does Alex, that feel that's sharing a wild that now? Story. Uh, yeah, it feels, it feels good and it feels somewhat like, in, in a sense, I feel rewarded for my efforts. Um, I, don't, I don't really pay attention to it, to be honest, in my day-to-day -day life. I should acknowledge it more. Um, but I have to remind myself of those things. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like I'm very fortunate to have had that experience. And I wouldn't change anything. would not change anything today. How come in that really, really dark moment, you could turn it around and spin it into a positive light where a lot of people will go the opposite? Yeah, Kev, I had a choice to do that as well. Um, but the opposite meant no life. Mm, you know, I have correct. to create a life. Like, you know, this is, we're here for a very short amount of time. You know, to us, it seems like a long time, you know, whether you live for 80 years or 100 years. But when you look at the age of this earth and the universe, it's a tiny second. You're here for a fraction. And you've got to squeeze everything you can out of this life. So to give up at that point, I owed it to my wife, to a child that I was about to have, my, my son. Um, I didn't really have that option. Like, and I've always been driven in life through mm. watching my parents struggle. I think that's helped give me more motivation. Like, you know, my dad um, never really did well in terms of his work career. He struggled and I watched it. We were, you know, living week to week and those things motivated me. I watched it and said, I'm not going to be in this position when I get older. Mm. I'm going to make sure that I create something that's, that's not this. Yeah. And no disrespect to my parents because they give me everything I need, mm. you know, all the love, all the care. But financially, we weren't in a good place ever. Um, but that was a, a driving factor for me. You know, I look at my son today, have I handled parenting well? I could have done it a lot better. Mm. Like I, I'm learning lessons as I go. My son's turning 12 soon. Um, he lives a very privileged life, um, but that might have blunted his drive, his motivation mm. to succeed because someone that's given everything doesn't really have to work for it. Mm. Um, there's no challenge there. It's an expectation almost that it'll come to them. Mm. I don't think that's a good place to be. And when I look at a lot of my friends that were at private school and had very successful parents, many of those didn't get to the success in their careers that they wished for. But coming from a low socioeconomic background, being surrounded by, I guess, people that were in broken families, and it wasn't a great upbringing in that sense, but it gave me a lot of drive and motivation to make sure I don't live that life. Definitely. Now, I heard you speak about this before. When that change happened and you went from that 500K up, you said you reduced your core area from multiple suburbs down to 400 houses is that right yeah yeah close to so you know in real estate there seems to be a pattern where agents are reluctant to be focused in a narrow geographic patch and that's somewhat of a scarcity mentality which i had for a decade plus my concern was you know i had four suburbs twenty thousand houses but i never did well in any of them i did okay but i never really dominated mm. My concern was that if I narrowed that down to one suburb or half a suburb, there's just less opportunity. Now, how am I going to survive? If I'm struggling with four suburbs, how am I going to make it work with one? But then I watched others in our network at McGrath. When I came to McGrath and I saw guys like Peter Chauncey, mm -hmm. Matt Steinway, mm -hmm. you know, guys that are still at the top of their game mm -hmm. within our company and within the industry, they were doing small patches. There were like 1,200 homes, 2,000 homes. I'm like, hang on a sec, like... How are these guys making these big numbers on GCI doing such a small patch? Yeah. So I completely shifted. I took 20,000 homes and I culled it to a quarter of one suburb. So I took Indrapilly, I divided it into four, and I took the quadrant that was the highest value pocket of that area. 
That was my focus, 773 houses. I had sold nothing in there before, even though I'd done all the four suburbs. That was a high-end market that I never was able to break into. I was doing units and townhouses and sort of low-end product. But that's the patch I chose and I became consistent. I, I put quality content in the letterbox. I door knocked them. I met the owners. It was easy to manage. 770 is a lot easier to manage than 20,000. 20,000 do a letterbox drop and you, yeah. you've spent all this money and then you don't do one for another three months. Yeah. I was consistent, high quality content. And then I built market share within that zone and I got to 68% market share. It took about 18 months, two years. From then we grew and scaled with the same formula in neighboring suburbs. Wow. Mm. So it sounds like you went niche to go out. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think there's a saying that rather than going a mile wide, and an inch deep, I went an inch wide and a mile deep. So I went narrow, focused, consistent, and that gave me credibility within that patch. Like mm. everyone got to know who I was. And real estate is a very profile driven business. It's not just based on skill. There's a lot of highly skilled agents that don't do very well. They've got all the attributes that you would need. They can list, they can sell, but they don't get the call in. They're not on the shopping list of the consumer. And you have to build profile and it's easier to build profile in a smaller scale than it is on a huge scale. So mm. narrow down that BDA, become the specialist of that pocket. Once you've established dominant market share, you then scale and mm. it's much easier to grow that way. So I had to come in and then go out. Now it's 10 suburbs that we're looking after. Wow. 10 suburbs. With the help of team members. <laughs> what does your team look like now? So there's the, the core team is myself, and three other selling agents that are servicing these 10 suburbs. One admin person that is doing all the background marketing, contracts and so on, and a virtual assistant in the Philippines that does some of the other work like ID for me's and things like that. Yeah. I do the same. Awesome, man, yeah. it works, it works. So that's, that's the core team. The team has evolved to a hybrid model. There's a couple of agents that have joined the office that do their own things within their own suburbs, but then they partner up with me in other areas. So it's a hybrid model with a few other agents that we partner up together. They're not directly in my team for every listing because they do their own things, but we're connected nonetheless. Yep. So those three sales agents, are they associate agents or are they listing and selling agents? Yeah, interesting question. Like they are listing and selling, but we go into the presentation together in yep. almost all cases. We secure the business together. I then become lead agent on the portals, realestate.com domain. They are the co-agent on every listing. Uh, and that model works really well. Like yeah. it's hard for them to go and compete against the high end agents and be competitive mm -hmm. when they don't have the same track record or profile. Yeah. So they use, I guess, the team's record to get us in the door. We get in the door. If we win the business, then we go in together. They do a lot of the buyer work. I'll do a lot of the vendor work and help with the negotiations. And it's case by case. But we have a, a, an agreement where it doesn't matter how the business comes into that suburb whether they come to me, to them, whether it's a client that I've dealt with for 20 years, I've allocated these agents a geographic yep. space that they yep. own. So whatever comes in, they get paid on. Mm. So do you have associates that run under those agents? Uh, no, I don't as such. Really? Um, of those, some of them have partnered up with their like wives and partners. Okay. So they might have a partner that comes in a few days a week to support yep. them. But no, there's no like, we, we've got a pretty good model that's working at the moment. Um, but I've got to be mindful of those things once, if, once it gets out of control. But no, no associate agent that supports them. It's, it's them that's, doing their own thing. That's wild. It's, it's, so, it's so wild to hear that you can write those sorts of numbers with such little support staff. Yeah. Like I know four or five might seem like a, a lot, but when you're doing 10 million, it's, it's not. It's actually yeah. a small team for that number. Yeah, it's a small team. There's other uh, agents that we partner up with in the office that we do splits on as well. Yeah. Um, but I think it's possible. I think it, it's, it's it's very really. possible. <laughs> I think you can do more, actually. I think as a team of five agents, if you're all performing, if you all have synergy in mm. the way you approach the business, I think you can write 20 million um, and still have time to do things outside of work. There's this perception that everyone talks about they don't have time. Like your time, everyone's got time. Like you've got time to do whatever you want. You just choose your time. Um, but I don't see a limitation with that number of people. You have to have great mm. admin support. And yeah, we've got okay. an absolute 
weapon. weapon, like an amazing person that does everything for us behind the scenes. So without that person, who is the motherboard of our business, the, the team would probably cr- crumble. Alex, something that I found interesting just then listening to you is that you've spoke with certainty about your ability and your belief in being able to achieve a new desired outcome, where prior to you having that turning point, you had limitations in what you could achieve. Yeah. What shifted where you have this increased certainty and belief in yourself? Yeah, I mean, Dan, I, I lacked belief because I tried and I failed. You know, originally, when I got into the industry, I had very strong belief. I was like, I'm going to kill it here. But then as the years went and I wasn't really getting anywhere, I questioned my ability. I said to myself, you're not good enough. You obviously can't do it well. Others are better than you. You know, might, might as well find another job. And I wanted to leave in 2011. I looked at wow. alternative options. I wanted to get a sales role. Almost got into a pharmaceutical rep role, which would have been um, tragic because I'm very much against pharmaceuticals and everything that they propose. And 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 we won't go there. It's too deep. Um, <laughs> it's another podcast. But, uh, but how did it shift? Um, I changed brands. I saw others that were succeeding. Mm. The network that I was surrounding myself with at the previous companies that I was with was gave me limitations in my mindset. And there was no one doing a million dollars in the offices that I worked at ever. So for 12 years, best agents within my group were at that five, 600K mark. Yeah. So that was my belief system was based on my environment. Once mm-hmm. I came to McGrath and I saw that these guys are writing two, three million back then, uh, I started to have some belief, but until I started to see the results of my efforts, the belief was limited. As one listing came in and sold and I got another one, the belief started to build. And then it got to a point where there was real strong belief that, hey, I can make this and I can make this really good. Um, But it took me a couple of years at McGrath to get to that point. So it still took you a few years being surrounded by that environment to really? Yeah, I'd say two years. I, I came in and had a fairly reasonable success in my first year at McGrath. It had better branding. You know, the quality, the photography was better. I was more able to get these higher end listings, which I struggled with at my previous brand. So there was some benefit straight away, mm. but it took a while to shift my mindset from that failed agent for so long to someone who believed they could succeed in the industry. But once I believed in myself, everything became easier. And belief is so important in life. I mean, there's a, an analogy or a, I guess a, an example of way to think You know, picture yourself interviewing your future self. So your today self, how old are you, man? 25. 25. So 25-year-old is interviewing Dan from 85-year-old. So you're (laughs) sitting with Dan, he's 85. What advice would the 85-year-old give to the 25-year-old? Wow. Because that that will determine how you might want to live your life between now and then. You could play that a different way. You could say, Dan of today, Kevin of today, interviewing your previous self when you're 15, what advice would you give yourself back then? There's a lot Mm -hmm. of things that when you start to think that way, you might change the way you live. Um, But I find that that's very deep. When I think about that, Mm -hmm. and I I visualize that a lot, I have a very strong belief in visualization. I do that with everything in life. Um, And I do believe that your vision creates an energy the energy creates an action the action creates a character trait and that character trait creates your destiny so it starts with a vision it starts with a perspective nothing that we see today started differently they all started with a vision so what is the story that you tell yourself because that will determine your future and if you're a victim in your life and we all have reason to be victim i can play victim mentality oh, I can't run, I can't hug my kids and I've got Crohn's disease and I might get bowel cancer. There's all sorts of things I could say to myself and and they're valid. You could have the same, everyone could have the same, but that is the most taxing energy that you can live your life with. The reality is if you're living in this country, you're in the top 1% because you go and travel, you go and see the rest of the world and how they live. There are not millions, not tens of millions, not hundreds of millions, There's billions of people that would trade places with any of us today, any of us. Yet Mm. we will wake up sometimes and go, oh, damn, I've got to go to that meeting at nine o'clock. I couldn't be bothered. I'm so tired. That mentality is a waste of life. Cherish it. You're blessed. You're here. You're living. 
Look at where you're living, freedom. Like it's very different to where I came from. I came from Iran. We were in a war with Iraq. You know, I was, when there were planes bombing, we'd turn our lights off. I'd hide oh in the cupboard with mattresses. Gosh. And, you know, there was a lot of fear. I had fear when I came to this country when I was six because I felt that I wasn't in a safe place ever. Because when I was a kid, there was a war and you always had to watch out. And when the planes came and the sirens came and everyone turned their lights off because they're worried about the planes spotting them and bombing where the residential areas are, you know, those moments stood with me when I came to this country where there was a fear position of fear everywhere I went. And then I realized I don't have anything to be afraid of here. And what a blessing that is because mm. there are other people in the world right now that have fear constantly, genuine fear. You can live a life here very comfortably. So I think it's important to have perspective because if you have a different attitude towards your life, you're going to limit your destiny. What a wild story you've lived. Oh, yeah, there's pl plenty of wilder ones out there. Like there's so many out there that have, have more meaningful stories than I do. But it's my own perspective of how I interpret it, I guess. Mm. I don't feel like a victim at all. I completely accept my health condition. I wouldn't replace my health condition with good health. That's where I am at the moment today. So, and, and, and I'll tell you why That's I wouldn't. That's powerful. I, I wouldn't for many reasons. What I've had to live through has got me into research around health. I've spent 20 years reading about health, reading about the right decisions of what to eat, what not to eat. Though that information that I have now, I can use to give my children a better life. Mm. And I wouldn't replace that. If you said, I'll take away your bad health, but I'll also take away your knowledge, I'm not willing to trade that. No. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with where I am. Beautiful. Um, Do you, you mentioned something during the convo earlier, Alex, that you still at times live with anxiety. Do you feel that comes from your childhood? Possibly. They talk about generational trauma. Mm, um, yeah, that's... possibly, man. Um, you know, I, I think there's an old saying, I think it's Seneca, we suffer more in our minds than in reality. I think a recent survey was done by one of the top universities that said that over 80% of the things that you're worried about never eventuate. So, you know, this is the prison. It's all in here. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. mental. I've just got to make sure that I remain grateful. Those thoughts come to me all the time. I get anxiety around, you should have done this better. You should have called them. You didn't follow up. The email you sent, the way you handled the conversation, the interaction you had with that person. But I've just got to accept that, hey, man, that's life. Like, I'm cool with that. Um, but it's really important that I don't become a prisoner of my own mind. And mm. the anxiety possibly comes from my childhood. There was a lot of anxiety then. And there's a big story to that, which is deeper than what we've gone through. Uh, but I think all of that has created a more resilient human being of today. That's, that's what I'd like to believe in anyway. I'm, well, it sounds so. like it. Sounds like it. Is the visualization a tool that you've used out of a state to get out of this fear state? And then since implementing that with repetition that has helped you to create your success or was yeah. it just, is it something you were consciously doing or did it subconsciously occur because of yeah, it's a your great situation? question. It's really hard for me to pinpoint how it occurred. Um, I truly believe that every vision creates a certain energy, a footprint that is subconscious, but you will somehow find your way consciously getting to that moment. Mm. So, and there's an exercise you can do, which is writing your vision, which I have done selectively. I find this so powerful that I don't want to overuse it because I believe that if I do it too much, maybe it will stop working. That's wow. how strongly I believe in this because it's happened to me so many times now. When I've wrote a vision for myself, it has come to fruition every single time, every single time. What's a vision involve? A vision involves me sitting down and writing about the future self that I want but I need to connect all my senses to that future self. For this to have impact, you are reprogramming your mind. You're telling your mind that this event exists already. It doesn't, but your mind believes it already does. And for some magical reason, your life will direct you to that point. So what I would do is I'd write, I'd connect my senses to the point I'd say, let's say you wanna write a million dollars GCI and you're an agent and you're you know, sitting there wondering, what am I gonna do? I would sit down and say, it's June 30, 2025. I am delighted. I sit here comfortably. I can hear my colleagues in the background talking. I can smell the coffee that they're brewing. And I've just looked at my numbers and I've just cracked a million dollars for this financial year. What an amazing feeling. I feel 
over the moon. You've got to connect every sense, your, your hearing, your seeing, your smell, your feel to that moment. And for me, if you do that well and you read that back to yourself repeatedly, I don't know how, the, how this works, but in my life, I've managed to get to that point every single time. So that vision I believe in, I'm, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual in law that of regard. Attraction, yeah. Manifestation. Yeah. Law of attraction, manifestation. There, there's something there. Like there is a power there that we cannot see. There's a frequency in all of us. Every feeling has a different frequency. I mean, you walk into a room and there's tension. Like you can feel it. There's mm. tension. That's an energy. Mm. We just have been indoctrinated not to be able to be receptive to these things through our schooling system. You know, we see half a percent of the UV spectrum. So all, all, all we're taught to do is believe what you see, but there's so much more beyond that. Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah, that, that's a different topic. <laughs> we're going, going, going deep, man. Yeah, How far away, deep. Alex, do you visualise What's from that? where you are to where you want to be, how far would how you? How far? Different time frames. Um, I'll, I'll, like right now, I'll visualize my new home that we're moving into or we're hoping to build. Uh, I visualize myself playing with my children in the backyard. I actually visualize my condition healing as well. Not to say that that's a realistic thought, but hey, let me give it a try. So I'm visualizing two, three years in advance. But I'm also visualizing 10, 20 years in advance when my children have moved out of the house, how I live my life with my wife, what we're wow. going to do. Um, and I constantly think about those things because I believe those visions will create my reality. And I reckon that's true. Well, it seems so to I. be the case. Yeah. And I, I think it works for everyone. Like everyone's got this ability. Uh, but we're just not taught that, you know, like no one teaches you these things. Why not many auctions? Oh man, that's an interesting question. Controversial for our industry. Um, why not many auctions? Probably Brisbane's a little bit different. Okay. So Queensland law is that you cannot disclose a price or a range Correct. or give any reference point around value if you sell by auction. Correct. We're the only state in the country with this legislation. In my experience, when you don't benchmark value, when you don't give reference to where it needs to be, you are effectively saying to the consumer, to the buyer, Kev, you tell me where you think it's, where you think it sits. What do you think it's worth? And when you let the buyer decide value, dictate value, in my experience, they come in way under. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying auctions don't work. Auctions can work if you've got a good agent that knows how to manage the process, if you've got a product that lends itself to auction. I'm not a believer of this blanket approach that everything should be auctioned, not in my world. And when I look at the clearance rates in Brisbane, they're averaging between 30 and 45% most weeks, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a bit less. Those numbers are inflated. They're not actually real data. It's based on the journalist sending a text message to the agent. You have an opt-in, opt-out option. That's how they collate the data. Yeah. So you can say, yes, I sold my auction or no, I didn't. And if you haven't sold your auction, you can stay silent. So a lot yeah. of the good news gets factored in. Um, when I look at the clearance rates that are hovering between 30 and 45%, a lot of them have dropped their reserves. Yeah. I don't think the 35, 30 to 45 is accurate. I think it's probably 20 to 30. Correct. So if they're failing seven, eight out, eight out of 10, then how does that make sense as a, as a method of sale? He's still pushing down them. Are you, he's still pushing the buyers down the unconditional path? Yeah. I mean, 65% of our contracts last year were no building and pest, no finance, no cooling off. We're getting auction conditions. Yeah. We are running auctions, which I would say there are silent auctions behind closed doors. So it's a multi-office scenario. The buyers are putting out their offers without knowing where the other one is. And there are big gaps between them. Every deal that I do, I look back and go, if this was an auction, where would it have landed? What would it would have achieved? And there's gaps. Like I sold one that was 3.85. Mm. The next buyer was a touch over 3.6. Yeah. That's a 250K gap. Auction would have been a bit of 3.6 and a little bit of higher bid. Here's okay. the other benefit of not auctioning. Sometimes you get a conditional offer that is stronger in price than the cash buyer. Yeah. That's often the case. They might say, hey, we need to sell our home or we need a finance course for 21 days, but they'll pay you a premium for that, for that risk. Now we get that offer and when we get the cash buyer to try and outrank that offer on price. So we get the higher price of the conditional offer and we use that offer to try and get the cash buyer to compete. So now we've got the best of both worlds. Love that buyer wouldn't have come to auction. So auction, the reason I don't do auction, because I don't believe it's in the seller's favor for the majority of cases in Brisbane. Sydney, Melbourne, very different. I can see the benefit there. 
But once I see the evidence to support auction here, I'll be an auction agent. Gotcha. I haven't seen it yet. Gotcha. Um, another viewer question. What's your morning schedule like and how, 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 did, how did his prospecting look like in the early days? Okay. Morning schedule for me starts from the night before because the night before will govern the next day. If I sleep late, eat shit, oh, I won't feel great the next morning. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. So if I want to have a good morning, I've got to sleep early. I don't want to eat a couple of hours before I sleep. I've got to choose the right food. Um, when I wake up in the morning, I wake up with some level of motivation, but sometimes I struggle. You know, I've well, got to be. What's your why now? The why is look where I am today. Look what I've achieved and look where I was before. Look where I've come from. And if I don't take advantage of this opportunity, I will regret this for the rest of my life. So get the fuck up, get your shit on yes. and make it happen. Because there's no better alternative, man. Like, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to dwell in bed and just fucking feel sorry for yourself? Like, the life is out there. I'm in a beautiful country. I've got freedom. I've got peace. I've got safety. I've got children. I need, I need to get out there and do it. Let's make life happen. Man, it's exciting to be alive. Like, damn, look, we're not going to be around for long. All of our problems of today don't mean shit. In the next few years, they don't mean anything. We'll be gone. We'll be forgotten about. All these stresses and worries and anxieties mean nothing. So I've just got to create that mindset every day. But routine, I wake up in the morning. What time? Uh, it changes, man. I try and get up between five and six. Like in summer, I'll do five. Once it gets to colder in winter, it'll be 5.36. Um, I'm not as structured as some really You're high not level Matt Steinway, agents. For example. No man, no. I wish I was Matt Steinway. He's like, look at him. He'll, he'll eat me up, man. That guy. <laughs> um, that, you know, I, I, I do ice baths. I do saunas. I do two cold showers a day. Been doing two. it for eight to nine years, morning and afternoon or night when I get home. Um, I haven't missed the cold shower for a very long time. Once I got the flu, I was down. I missed a few days, but even when I was sick, I pushed myself to do the cold shower. Um, I believe in that. I believe that if you start your morning by challenging yourself, by mm. doing something that your mind says you do not want to do. Andrew Huberman talks about this. You've got to do something that you don't want to do. Now, mm. if you go in the morning in Sydney and you want to take a cold shower, every cell in your body will tell you, do not do this. But if you overcome that and you do it, you'll come out feeling better. You'll have endorphins. Physiologically, you'll feel good. But another thing, that day you'll have challenges that will come up and because you've overcome the first challenge the next challenge will be easier once you make a bad decision in the morning wake up late eat shit for breakfast you ride the day off so you're like fuck day today's fucked i'll just <laughs> yeah. do it tomorrow so this every morning for me i need to make sure that i push myself to do something i'm not comfortable with the cold shower is my routine um, and i find that that's created an element of resilience for the rest of the day Wow. Is there, an, is there anything that precedes that before you get into the office or work? Yeah, I, I do meditation. Um, not good because I suck at it, but I've been doing it for like 10 years now. We should be better at it. I do guided meditation on YouTube. It's usually a 10-minute or a 15-minute one. I do breathing exercises in the morning. I try and look at the sun. I try and get sunlight in my eyes. I believe yes. that's really important for yes. the circadian rhythm. So Grounding, I earth, earthing, earthing every, every day. I'm out on the grass. I water the garden every morning, like this morning. Do you I was watering really? Every morning, man. Every With morning. a coffee in hand. Oh. So I have a coffee and I'm watering the garden for a good 20, 30 minutes. Um, I love gardening. I love nature. Um, and I enjoy it, man. So I'm barefoot on the lawn, wet lawn, which will give you more earthing. If, it's, if, if anything that's wet, like walk along the beach, you'll get better earthing and you'll discharge the energy that you have in your body. Um, look who, at the sun. Who taught you all this? Like, is it all self-taught? Was there a mentor? Oh, there's not, nothing self-taught. I mean, some things I've picked up intuitively that made sense. But I read, I research. I'm, I'm fanatical yeah. about that. I like mm. follow people. And, you know, over the years, the things that I've done have been verified through scientific research. But, it, you know, I already had belief in it before, but the science has supported it. Zach Bush, I don't know if you heard of Zach Bush. I don't. Big fan of Zach Bush talks about these things. Oh, this is a totally different podcast, man. We'd go too deep, too deep. I just love the fact that, you know, you know what it is? It's um, all those little one percenters, the grounding, the earth thing, all that sort of stuff, the looking at the early, the, the first light in your eyes. You hear, you hear the Hubbermans of the world and all that stuff talk about it, but you never meet someone in real life doing it for real that's 
highly successful until right now. Oh, wow. That's profound, man. So, um, it, you know what? All that stuff that you talk about is something that I've you know, been doing and trying to do. And, you know, sometimes I fall out of my habits and sometimes I'm in my, in my zone and I'm doing all that sort of stuff. But um, seeing you and knowing, and knowing that the number one agent from McGraw does that stuff, that inspires the hell out of me, man. Oh, beautiful, bro. That's that. I'm gr- grateful for that effect because I have a theory that the if you can help others, there's a flow state that will benefit you. People can call it karma. You can call it whatever you want, but there's this flow state that it's almost like if you're adding value to the collective, the universe will want you around, and they will reward you for these efforts. Same as the opposite. If you're taxing. And not giving back, then bad things happen. So this, this I have a belief in. And for you to say that to me, man, that's that's rewarding for me. So that's beautiful, mate. This is unreal. Um, Do you mind if I stay on where we were? You sure. mentioned nutrition and diet. What what does that look like for you at the moment? I'm interested to hear your perspective. Yes, yeah, so I've got a I've got two um, autoimmune diseases so far in my life. <laughs> Hopefully that's it. Um, <laughs> It I'm, will be it. With yeah, the vision. well, we'll see, but I accept whatever comes. Um, I'm on a very restricted diet for that reason. I don't preach to anyone else to go on the diet that I'm on because maybe they've got good health. They don't need to go to the extremes that I'm going through. Uh, I'm on keto, so I don't need carbohydrates. I do believe the science that supports keto, I've looked into it quite thoroughly for any disease state. If you said to me, you've got Alzheimer's, you've got dementia, you've got uh, diabetes, Anything I think can benefit from a ketogenic diet. So my normal diet in the mornings, I'll wake up, um, I'll do eggs, I'll do avocado, I'll do spinach, I'll do mushrooms and no bread. Um, in, at lunch, I'll have a piece of meat and a salad. At dinner, very similar. It's quite a boring uh, life, my, my food life. Um, but if I don't eat this way, if I have a bowl of pasta or eat rice. My culture is all rice and carbohydrates and breads. How good is that yellow yeah. rice, the crispy rice? Yeah, man. Gourmet you, salad. Oh, you know this, man. Like the crispy rice, man. The crispy that rice. Is, you've got to, not many people know about the crispy rice. Um, but if I eat a normal diet, I can't function. My inflammation goes up. I struggle to move. I'm already fusing in my spine into a hunchback. Um, I can't think clearly. My energy levels are compromised. My mood is compromised from one bowl of pasta or a pizza. Wow. So when I, I used to go on holidays and break my diet because you know go to Byron, you know, get smashed and have a good time. <laughs> have a few. And but I realized that it wasn't worth it because my holidays were shit. I was like, far out. Oh. Why am I not enjoying the holidays? I'm waking up groggy, I'm feeling shit during the day. I'm way better at work because I was eating crap. So now I go on holidays, I am the same as normal. I will not take anything that's gonna compromise me. So that's the diet I'm on. When's the last time you had a drink? I don't drink, man. When's the last time you had um, a drink? Last time I had a drink, I probably drink maybe at a Christmas party or a, a wedding or a if so that. So here and there. So I would say I'm a two to three times a year drinker. Um, I don't take any pharmaceutical drugs for my diseases. I yeah. used to, but I've stopped that because they were problematic. All natural. Uh, all natural. I'm not saying my, mine's you, the right way. Are you um, all organic food too? Yeah, generally, not everything, because it's hard to get everything organic, but we buy organic meats, we shop at organic produce, but not everything's organic. There's yep. a balance. Um, but those things are important for me to maintain. Um, Did you ever in, in, look into any fruitarian yeah. models? Yeah, or I juice do. fasting? Yeah, uh, I do fasting, water fast. Um, I try and do that a couple of times a year of the three days. I'm trying to get to five day water fast. You just uh, did a water fast, didn't you? Yeah. How long did you do, man? I did a 10 day oh my juice God. and water fast. Oh, juice as well. Yeah, yeah got you. Um, the reason I don't choose fruit is because of the fructose factor. And if I was to take fruit, I would want to eat the fruit in its entirety because the fiber will balance out the fructose. Well, fruit juice takes out the fiber and it's just the sugar that you're getting. And I know there's a lot of good evidence for it. The reason I believe it works so well is because it gives a digestive tract a, 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 mm. a rest. So if you're on mm. juice fast, you're not t- taking solids. Um, I think it gives a rest to the digestive system, which will benefit anyone because most people are eating crap most, most days. Um, but I don't have any sort of protocol that is fruit only at this point. Beautiful. Um, maybe we've got another viewer question here. Uh, what's the three things you'd tell a brand new associate in the industry? 
I guess first is you've got a great opportunity. You've got to acknowledge that first. This is an industry that has no limits. You don't have to be educated. You don't have to have pedigree. You can come from nowhere and, and be very successful. First, you have to acknowledge that you've got a very special opportunity because if you don't acknowledge that, you're probably not going to take advantage of it. So that's number one. Be grateful for where you are. You're an industry that you could do anything with. There's no cap here. Second is be willing to make sacrifices. Nothing good in life comes easily. Nothing good in life comes easily. The hard things that you're avoiding is the answer to your problem. Do what's difficult. Do what's challenging. The call that you don't want to make, make 10 of those calls. Don't think about what you're going to say. Pick up the phone and make the damn call. It's about numbers here. This is, this is something that agents avoid. It's a numbers game. It is a numbers game. And the conversation should sound good. You want to add some value to them, but you're better off having a conversation than not having one. So that's number two. Number three, number three I think is make sure that you are a specialist in your market because I think that's the best formula to succeeding in real estate. You're either a geographic specialist within a certain precinct I would say 2,000 homes is the limit to what I'd start with. In that 2,000 patch, I want to see $100 million worth of annual turnover. Yep. If I've got $100 million worth of annual turnover, I can create a business that will give me at least a million GCI, but in reality, I'm going to get a lot more than that. So $100 million worth of turnover in a 2,000 home maximum patch, and I want to dominate that area. Every person in that pocket needs to know who you are. You've got to get to them through letterbox, through calls, through texts, through geographic social media ads, door knocking, something that people are afraid of doing. You've got to reach the entire audience. I think if you follow that formula, you can, you can break into a, a better business. Um, now, being mindful of your time, Alex, what my last question for you, um, it's a selfish one. This year I should do three mil. Next year my goal is five what would you be doing differently to switch it to go from three to five or would you just stay consistent? Are you on an upward trajectory at the yes. moment? Well, we don't want to change that too much. Are you expanding your business in any way to give you the opportunity to get mm, to five? More associates. Yeah, it's okay. Have you done your numbers on what is achievable within the geographic space that you're targeting? No. Okay, so I would want to quantify that scientifically. So I'm going to say to you, Kev, how many houses in your geographic farm area or BDA? Then I want to know from there, how many transactions per annum? What's the average sale price? And I need to now know the total volume of sales within that patch. Because if we have aspirations to get to five and we've got an area that's only delivering eight or 10, well, you're going to have to have pretty dominant market share to get there. So I need to know that the numbers are within reach. Yeah. So total volume, total value, if you said, oh, Alex, there's a billion dollars worth of turnover per annum in my geographic space, well, I think you're going to do 10 million, not five. I think you undercooked yourself. <laughs> um, but it has to, the numbers have to stack up. So I need to find out what's available, what's a reasonable percentage of market share. I would say 30%. That's re re realistic. And then let's work towards that. But let's break down those numbers scientifically so we know where we're, where we're headed. I really appreciate that. Thank oh, you. Do you do, this all, do this, you do the same for yourself? Yeah, definitely. From yeah. 10 to 20? Yeah, yeah, we do. You know, it's funny. You know, I've got a lot of people that look at my business and go, oh, this guy must have it all well-structured and awesome database and, you know, just everything's just doing really well. The truth is it's not. There's a lot of gaps in the business. There's a lot of things I don't do well i have got to improve on. So even at a level that might seem to others successful, there's a lot of failures that I have to correct mm. as well. Uh, but I have belief now. I've got belief. I can get to 20 mil. Am I motivated to get to 20? Not, not really. Like if that motivation has never been, I've never had a GCI target in my life, but I've had really? market share targets. For me, the market share will bring the GCI as a, as a byproduct. So all I'm focused on is dominant market share. Every year that might change. You know, some years there's high volume transactions. In the last few years, it's been low volume. But if I can maintain dominant market share and I know the numbers in each area, I know that I'll get to the, the outcome I need. Love it. 
Would you, what advice would you have for any buyer's agents out there like myself? Buyer's agents are, for me, becoming more and more important in the, in the real estate landscape. Um, for me, it's about relationships with selling agents. So I would be connecting with them on a social level, going out for coffees, taking them to lunch, catching up outside of work, because ultimately the selling agent is going to give you the opportunity that you need, particularly mm. when you're trying to get the off-market deals. And that's what most buyer's agents want to show value to their client. They wanna show them they've found something that they wouldn't have found themselves. Mm. When it comes to realestate.com on domain, the buyer probably feels like, geez, we could have done that ourselves. So you know, how are you gonna get those opportunities? You've gotta be top of mind. How do you become top of mind? It's your relationship with the selling agents that'll give you that opportunity. So I'd wanna connect with them. I'd find the top 10 agents and I'd connect with them on a social level, coffees, lunches, text messages. If they're interested in something that you are, NRL, let's share ideas on that. That connection, that relationship will then give you the opportunity for your client. I would see that as a, as a benefit. Thank you. Amazing. Pleasure, bro. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Pleasure. Super appreciative. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Alex Jordan, everyone. Thank you. Holy smokes, we actually made it. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of our listeners, past and present, because we've officially hit 50,000 followers on Instagram. It's blown my mind to see the, how we've been able to build one of the biggest real estate brands in the country just off starting a podcast where we interviewed people starting in Zoom. So off the back of that, building all these relationships and having people know us in Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, we now have access to all these off-market properties which I can't service with my current clients. We've got more properties than I have clients. So if you are looking to buy your next home to live in or investment, please reach out. Additionally, I know Kevin is the king of Kellyville, but if you're not based in Kellyville and you are looking to sell your home, we know all the best agents and, the, and could put you in with the right fit that suits you. So just wanted to give you a quick shout out, guys. Thank you so much for the support up until now. Both sides 50, baby.